My name is Ernest Sternglass, and I'm a professor of uh, radiation physics uh, in the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Retired now, but still very active, and I'm um, on my way to Japan, and I'm stopping off here uh, in California briefly. Uh, I'm going on a lecture tour in order to be able to explain the danger of radiation from bomb testing and more recently from nuclear reactors and finally from the depleted uranium weapons, tons of which have been used in Iraq and which are now affecting the whole world. And My concern is about the health of people. I'm very concerned that we are totally destroying the future of our nation and that in recent years the nuclear reactors have been working so hard to push them for the last nickel to come out and get the most electricity and the most money out of them that they have in fact turned out to replace the bomb fallout that we experienced during the 1950s and 60s and in fact bomb testing continued until 1980 in the atmosphere and most people don't realize it, that our country, U.S., continued underground bomb testing with many times exploding through the ground until 1992. And the last underground test by China didn't take place until 93. And the effects have been hundreds to thousands of times greater than anything we expected on the basis of a hundred years' worth of knowledge of X-rays. And that's really what's so important, that we vastly underestimated what radiation from fission products, when uranium breaks into two, as it does in the bomb, or it does in a nuclear reactor, that these wastes, which are sometimes let out of the stack, go in and tur turn out to be so much more serious than anything that we have ever, ever expected. And unless we learn this, we are going to produce a generation of children who are much more handicapped and who are in many ways much more handicapped in ways that we are now learning that autism and things like uh, uh, typically uh, low birth weight and childhood cancer and infant mortality have been rising most in the states that have nuclear reactors, but now everywhere, even in the states that have no nuclear reactors, because the depleted uranium particles that were produced when any of these big ammunitions uh, made out of uranium metal hit metal or a rock, they certainly then turn out to produce a very fine particles that act like a gas that go around the world and come down with the rain and snow and get into our diet everywhere and are now causing enormous health care and not just cancer. That's really the important part. And we need to understand, unless we do something about it, we are vastly increasing not only the suffering of people and the death of over 20 million people in this country that have died ever since above normal expectation since the nuclear bomb was developed. And now I'm on my way and I have to talk about this in Japan. I have to talk about it in a conference in Hiroshima. And that will be very difficult because I was in the Navy at the time when the bomb was dropped and it may have saved my life. And that's really the terrible thing that only by suffering do human beings learn terrible lessons. Just like in the Middle Ages, we didn't realize that unless we had clean water and knew what to do with our sewage, we would create big epidemics of illness. And now we are in a situation we are doing it with uranium in the wind. And that's the tragedy that has to be brought out because we cannot survive as a nation by destroying one generation of children and their ability because that's that's what the future depends upon the health of our children and that's why I'm talking about this subject today I 
was born in Berlin and my parents were physicians. My father was a dermatologist and he was talking to my mother who was a gynecologist and pediatrician over the dinner table when I was a child and they talked about the danger of x-rays because my father had to treat children, young people and older people who had skin cancer and then he found out that many of them had been treated for acne with x-rays and so he had to cure their skin cancer and that's a terrible thing to find out that people have made great mistakes in the use of radiation even during the early years of the discovery of x-rays and the, the discovery of um, uranium and nuclear fission which uh, took place in 1938-39 which is about the year I escaped with my family from Hitler's Germany and we were lucky but the reason I became so interested in radiation both from the point of being useful and from the point of view of being very dangerous is that as a child I used to walk into shoe stores and I used to love to watch and look at my toes through the shoe because they had x-ray machines in the shoe stores and this way you could find out whether you shoe, well, you shoe fitted or not and so I learned at the same time the fun and the benefit of x-rays and of course I also learned the danger of x-rays and that got me oriented for the rest of my life and even when I went to college I became interested in the history of x-rays and the history of radiation and physics and engineering and finally I began to um, you know get a degree first in electrical engineering and and uh, but my interest has always persisted because my father encouraged me my mother they took me uh, in fact uh, they took me to the laboratory where the man who invented these yellow sodium vapor lamps on the highway it was one of his patients so I became interested in medicine and physics <laughs> and the danger of x-rays <laughs> ultraviolet radiation that my mother used in her office to treat people and, and so early in life I was oriented exactly towards both the benefit and the danger of radiation but the most important thing happened is that when I was drafted and went into the Navy just about to be shipped out to the invasion of Japan when the atomic bomb ended the war and in a way, tragically it was, but I felt it saved my life. And that is a feeling that is just so conflicting between feeling good about being alive and being sad about this terrible business of using one bomb to kill a hundred thousand people at one time. And so we have to learn from our experience. And so I became interested in this whole problem of what can we do to avoid extinguishing the human race with nuclear weapons and that's what I've dedicated my life to when I got out of the Navy and um, I worked at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory after a few years I uh, I lost a child and that got me also to become very concerned about what could happen to a young baby that all of a sudden couldn't sit up and all of a sudden had some kind of defect and it was not until many years later that we found out it was a disease that was caused by some mutation in some ways back in time in previous generations possibly it was Tay-Sachs disease that both my wife and had the genes for it and we could never have children but it made me also know what it means to lose a young child as a baby and so with this background I went back to Cornell and went to graduate school in engineering physics and I got my degree and my masters and then my PhD at Cornell using this phenomenon where an electron hits any kind of solid and knocks out more electrons which is used in the photomultiplier tubes that open doors when we walk up to a certain door and it automatically opens as a light beam and that detects our presence and uh, as a result the photoelectrons are released and the secondary electron multiplies it and it sends a signal to open the door 
And that's what we were doing. So I was interested in the application of physics and in, in, in practical things like one was to um, improve the uh, ability to take x-ray pictures or fluoroscopy with less radiation because we were using a lot of radiation during fluoroscopy. On a fluorescent screen you stand there and they look at you for a few minutes maybe and you get an enormous dose and so it so happened that I was able to work on a big image intensifier that cut the dose in fluoroscopy by a hundred to two hundred fold and that was done at the Westinghouse Research Lab because they heard me give a talk on my work at Cornell and uh, they asked me to come to work on the research uh, of uh, electron physics for imaging tubes. It's interesting because that was a very satisfying kind of work. It allowed me to think that I could help to reduce many unnecessary x-rays which produce a risk of cancer. And uh, so early in life uh, I had been encouraged to do that by someone who um, I never would have expected it from but it was Albert Einstein, the famous professor who uh, received the Nobel Prize in 1905, well for his work that he did in 1905 to um, you know, to develop the special theory of relativity. His study was also included the process where a light beam hits a metal plate and knocks out an electron. And so um, someone, a professor I knew, a distant relative, who asked me, why don't you write a letter to Einstein about how your theory that you're trying to develop is related to his theory on the photoelectric effect for which he won a Nobel Prize. And so I wrote him a letter and he invited me to come to Princeton. And uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to talk with him about my work and, <laughs> and he was such a nice gentle old man at the time he was already almost 70 and, uh, and I was only 23. And, uh, but he asked me whether I could still speak German since I was born in Germany and was interested in physics. He said, let's talk in German, it's easier for me. And so we sat down and talked, and would you believe, I couldn't believe it. Sometimes the secretary would come in and he said, Dr. Einstein, there's someone waiting for you. Or he said, could you, um, you know, the, would you like, you know, me to tell you this, the other things you need to do. And he said, no, no, be right back. And he came back and we talked for five hours. And that, in effect, had an enormous effect on my life because among things he encouraged me to pursue my theory and I finally got it all published and uh, then he also told me let's go for a walk I want to talk to you some more about your ideas on the nature of the fundamental particles of the universe which were just being discovered new particles were being discovered in cosmic rays and it was a very interesting time but there were some new particles that were much heavier than the electron but less heavy than the proton and and they were disintegrating in an instant but nobody knew what they were composed of. And I had the idea that since they all decayed into electrons, and I was always interested in electrons anyhow, I thought maybe the whole universe, is, this is the only truly fundamental particle, the electron and its opposite uh, partner, the positron that had the same mass but the opposite, uh, opposite um, charge. And he said, well, he said, um, keep on thinking about these things and so he encouraged me to pursue this but he said look don't go back into academia they will kill every bit of originality out of you <laughs> in order to become a full professor you have to get approved on every level and you cannot question the existing ideas too much or else you won't get promoted so Einstein said have a shoemaker's job for the rest of your life so that you can do something useful uh, for humanity, you know, and don't make the mistake I made. I accepted a position in Berlin where I had nothing to do but to solve the mystery of the universe and nobody can do that. And therefore, you should do that in the evenings and have a day job <laughs> when you can <laughs> work and do something really useful for humanity. And he was absolutely right. It allowed me to accept a position, uh, you know, in the research lab at the Westinghouse Research 
laboratory in Churchill that had just been built when I was finished with graduate school and they invited me to come and I used my work that Einstein encouraged me to do to develop a new kind of camera tube. In fact, it's called the SEC Viticon and it was used by NASA to take the pictures that went along on the moon to the moon in 1969 and took the pictures of people stepping on the moon for the first time and everybody in the world saw the pictures with what I felt with my camera tube which is very nice because our group developed it at Westinghouse and and it gave me a great deal of satisfaction and then later on uh, the same tube that was sensitive to the ultraviolet light coming from the distant universe was used in the first orbiting uh, small observatory that was just like the Hubble but much smaller and it gave us the first pictures in the ultraviolet light from distant stars, the most distant stars, billion, 13, 20, 15 billion years away. 15 billion years they took to travel to reach our camera tube. So, and we had developed a, a telescope that would go on the moon, a small portable telescope, no bigger than a foot in diameter. It would have outperformed the biggest telescope on Earth because there's no atmosphere on the moon. And so, I was looking forward to it and then the Vietnam War cut it all off because the Vietnam War caused the NASA budget to be cut and we stopped working and we couldn't get another mission to the moon to set up the telescope that would have really given us a very early picture of what was going on in the beginning of the universe, how stars were formed and planets were formed, everything. And then later on came the Hubble. And the Hubble would have had my camera on it, but by that time, uh, new uh, solid-state television tubes were developed, the kind that we're using right now here in this room to talk about, to, to record what I'm saying. They're tiny little devices that make miniature cameras possible, and that meant that my SEC Viticon was no longer needed. <laughs> but it was a pioneer in terms of sending back pictures from, from the moon and from other, other stars. It's been used on other telescopes in the world, but not on the Hubble telescope. Then, uh, because at the Westinghouse Research Lab they were working on image intensifiers to cut the dose from fluoroscopy that normally was very high where you stand in front of a screen and the doctor looks at you, and that Edison invented way back in the beginning of the 20th century in the 1900s, um, and we needed to cut back on radiation and that was very interesting. So I felt I could help cutting back the dose and improve the images and so we worked, I worked for 15 years at the Westinghouse Research Lab trying to lower the amount of radiation that people would get from um, x-rays. And then when the job of, uh, for NASA was killed by the Vietnam War then I, then I accepted a position at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine to, to start a new department of electronic imaging to replace ordinary photography and make it more efficient. And that was very important because many people were being overexposed by fluoroscopy and film and so on and we needed to develop new ways of, of taking more sensitive pictures, not just in the infrared the way I did for the Navy, but in the X-ray field and the ultraviolet field and, and also for um, radioactive isotopes which were used to create images for medicine. And so since about 1967 I worked um, for the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and I'm still a professor there. I was very fortunate in being able to continue the work on radiation because I had become aware that the government was continuing bomb testing and, and the bomb testing was giving everybody more radiation dose. And that meant that um, it was counter what I was trying to do to reduce x-ray dose, to reduce radiation dose. And so I began to investigate just exactly what the fallout from bomb testing in New Mexico and then in the Pacific and then in Nevada what this bomb fallout that came down would do. And sure enough, I discovered 
that it was much more serious than we had ever expected on the basis of all the x-ray studies that we have done over the years. Uh, women would go to supermarkets and places and there would be a, a portable x-ray unit that would uh, allow uh, them to get x-rayed or it's examined and, and, and so many people were overexposed and many developed breast cancer. And in fact, some of the earlier studies on the danger of radiation for women uh, was especially due to the use, the widespread use of survey cameras to um, actually, it was not a camera, it was a fluorescent screen and or film to take pictures of people uh, just to detect uh, TB. Well, so then I found out uh, that the amount of radiation that was coming down was small but the effects of a given amount of radiation that was measured with a Geiger counter or measured with, you know, instruments was hundreds to thousands of times greater from fallout than we had expected. And that meant that it was important to end bomb testing. And that got me involved in, in writing a paper because at that time a, a woman by the name, a woman doctor by the name of Dr. Alice Stewart in England in 1956 had begun to find by a survey of women who had children that died of leukemia and cancer early in life before the age 10, uh, she asked them to fill out forms whether or not at that time it wasn't known why there was such a rise of childhood leukemia and cancer in the 1950s. And so she uh, looked at it and and she decided she would send that questionnaire to about a hundred women who had children who died or developed leukemia and cancer and then she would take a control group of a hundred who had healthy children and find out what's the difference. Did you work uh, with benzene? Did you have any um, other factory experience where you're exposed to God knows what? And so they all filled out the forms and at the end of the form she said, did you have any x-rays? And she found that the women who had children that died early in life had been getting x-rays during pregnancy, especially during the last month or so, to find out what the position of the baby is and whether or not, you know, uh, it's going to be a difficult delivery. And that was quite common in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s uh, until the 50s, when Dr. Stewart discovered that it took less than one fiftieth, maybe one one hundredth of the radiation dose to a child in its early stage of development in the mother's womb to develop leukemia and cancer. And that meant that she had done a tremendous, you know, significant discovery that most doctors were very unhappy about because they were being told that they made great mistakes, just like my father made this. I mean, my father's colleagues made mistakes with x-rays and so once again only by suffering and unnecessary and sadly enough many children in the world were getting x-rays during early life and that meant that many more children developed leukemia and cancer. And so she discovered this and wrote papers and in fact it's interesting I, I, I make a plot. She found there was a direct relationship between the number of x-rays given and the risk that the child would develop cancer. And, and I felt that this is something that everyone should know and that in fact has many years after she discovered it, the doctors finally accepted it when Dr. Brian McMahon at Harvard did the same study in the United States and found there was this direct relationship between the number of x-rays reported in the hospital just like the mothers had reported and they were truthful. They had quite accurately found that it were the x-rays that the large number that were given that caused this epidemic at least contributed to the epidemic of, um, of, of childhood cancer and leukemia. So that was one of the things that I was very upset about and uh, tried to find new ways of reducing dose. And so we developed new kinds of semiconductor devices that would quickly scan the breast or quickly scan the chest or the abdomen in order to get uh, 
pictures that were better but at lower dose, 10, 20, 50 times lower than it would took with film. And so I was therefore very much concerned when the bomb testing began and it was really a bad time. It was really awful because we didn't know how serious it was. We believed it was no bigger risk than x-rays and we were completely wrong. And one of the ways that we discovered it many years later unfortunately, not until the 1990s, when I had retired and, and I was working on uh, uh, ways of educating people about the need to end all bombs and to end all bomb testing. The first time I was involved in it is uh, very early because in 1962 we had this Cuban Missile Crisis where the Russians had put nuclear warheads and rockets in Cuba and were aiming it at the United States and we had rockets in Turkey aiming them with nuclear warheads aiming them at Russia and we were about to have a terrible nuclear war because the generals in Cuba had the authority to launch nuclear weapons and if they were attacked by in any way and that would have been so terrible. Well anyhow by that time I had done studies on the fallout from bomb fallout and I knew that one had to begin to do something about this. And so the first thing that I did uh, early in 1962, I wrote a paper in which I said if Dr. Stewart's findings about the increase of childhood cancer with only a tiny fraction of what it takes to produce it in an adult, if that is going to be true and confirmed, then we would have an epidemic of childhood cancer and leukemia and maybe other cancers if we don't stop testing in the atmosphere. And that was in 1962. And I wrote the paper and sent it into Science and they didn't want to publish it because the editor worked for the Atomic Energy Commission during the war and helped to build the bomb and he didn't want to believe that Dr. Stewart's findings would have any significance and he, he didn't want to do it. So I had a big fight to get this paper published and among the people who helped me to get it published was a, a friend of a colleague of a friend at the University of Pittsburgh by the name of Dr. Schubert. His friend was Dr. Ralph Lapp who um, was happened to be on the Science Advisory Board to President Kennedy. And so I went to see uh, um, Ralph Lapp and I showed him uh, the graph uh, that I just showed you how there was a direct relationship, there was no safe threshold and that every bit of new fallout from bomb testing would cause to kill many babies. And during that summer Kennedy had a wife who was pregnant and during the late summer of 1963, the following summer after I saw Lap, he actually had a child that died. And therefore, I think Kennedy was more open to conclude a treaty because Ralph Lap showed him my paper. And in June, that was published in June in Science of 1963. And Kennedy went on the air in July of 1963 and said we must end strontium-90 in the bone of our children from the bomb testing and end leukemia in their blood. And he urged people to cause their senators to ratify the treaty that he had just arranged to be signed in Moscow to end all bomb testing in the atmosphere by the Russians, by the British, and by the US. And fortunately, uh, that was hopeful, but he needed to get it um, approved by the Senate. And Dr. Edward Teller, who you know, was the, one of the people who helped to develop the hydrogen bomb, uh, didn't think that it was safe for us to stop testing. We needed to keep testing to build better and bigger nuclear weapons and we needed to protect the national security and he thought there was no effect you could walk into a bomb crater right away after the bomb was detonated you wouldn't have any effect at all 
And so on the one hand, Teller was urging Congress not to approve it, and here Kennedy wanted to see it approved. And sure enough, uh, a few weeks after this broadcast in July, I got a letter inviting me to testify in Congress about the danger of radiation as I had explained in my article for the newborn um, that Dr. Stewart had discovered. And we had found that the end, the temporary halt to nuclear testing that began in about 1958-59 and lasted until 60-61, that this temporary halt and bomb testing was ended when the Russians detonated a bomb over Siberia, northern Siberia, not far from Norway, in the northern latitude near the North Pole. The bomb had the equivalent of 50 million tons of TNT compared to only 10,000 tons for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. And that one bomb, one single bomb, gave an abdominal x-ray to every person on the northern hemisphere in this world. And that was so bad that the Federation of American Scientists, of which I was president in Pittsburgh, decided that we have to end bomb testing and that this could not be done. And that's why I wrote this paper. And when it finally did get published, it had a good effect because I was asked to go and testify before the Senate, a Joint Atomic Energy Commission in August of, 20, August of 1963. And I flew down there with my wife, and it was her birthday. And lightning was all around the plane, and I was afraid, afraid for my life because it was very close. And and they diverted the plane. It couldn't fly into the airport and the national airport, and they diverted it, and it landed, thank God, in Dallas. And that's how I began this trip to Washington. And two days later, I had to testify in the Senate. And fortunately, uh, it happened that uh, I was able to explain and, and show the reason why we had underestimated the danger of nuclear fallout so much compared to x-rays, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, I was very happy when Dr. Brian McMahon from Harvard University came and was asked, do you believe what Dr. Sternglass has found? And, and he said, well, personally, uh, we did a study in this country uh, to duplicate what Dr. Stewart did in England, and we also found that there was a direct relationship without threshold for the children developing cancer and leukemia of other types, all kinds of cancers, brain cancer and uh, everything. And we also found there's no safe threshold. So although I have my own, you know, reservations about Dr. Sternglass's conclusion, I have to admit there is every possibility that nuclear bomb testing could continue to create a huge epidemic of cancer. And fortunately, a few weeks later, the Senate did vote and it approved the test ban treaty. And ever since then, I felt that if I'd done nothing else in the rest of my life, if I could have saved the life of my own children and my great-grandchildren and that of my friends and family and people all over the world, then that was a pretty good thing to have for a record in my life. And, but I was very, very fortunate that I was able to do work and keep on working for so many more years, trying to educate people about the need to end nuclear bomb testing and the end of ending all nuclear weapons because they were really the worst biological weapons, the most potent biological weapons that human beings have ever devised. But the governments of the world, our government, the Chinese, the French, everybody was reluctant to admit that all the bomb testing they did, and hundreds of bombs were detonated in the atmosphere by Russia, by us, by the French, and even the, uh, by the Chinese until 1980. They just did not want to admit to themselves, especially after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that there was not just a blast like an ordinary bomb, but that irradiated people 
directly and gave a huge flash of radiation which killed many people over years afterwards, but that it also led to radioactive fallout that went around the world everywhere and caused huge epidemics that were not recognized at the time of children being born underweight. And that's one of the things we only discovered many years later. And fortunately, we did end the bomb testing, and that's you can see in this graph. This is, um, this is called low birth weight percent, 1945, 1995, in New York State, and strontium-90 in the bone, which is only produced by bomb testing. And you can see that the low birth weight went up and peaked around 1900 and uh, or typically in the early 60s, and then came down again, and it followed exactly the rise of strontium-90 found by the Atomic Energy Commission Laboratory in New York all over the country. There was a rise of strontium-90 in the bone, exactly like Kennedy had talked about in, the, in his, um, uh, in his uh, address to the nation. And when it ended, it went down again. And thank God, it kept on going down. But we see that sometime around 1985, 86, it began to rise suddenly and began to rise and hasn't con continued, failed to go down. And that was the time of Chernobyl, when the accident in Russia affected babies born in the United States. And yet everyone says, oh, Chernobyl didn't harm anybody except maybe 32 men who were exposed in the plant. Hundreds of thousands and probably millions have died as a result and will die in the future as a result of the accident at Chernobyl. And so we vastly underestimated what's really going on in the world and we are threatening the very existence of our society because when babies are born below five and a half pounds and especially below two and a half pounds they have a much greater chance of dying. And the tragedy is that the rise continued all through the recent years. And we've now measured in my group that I started after retirement in New York called the Radiation and Public Health Project. Uh, we decided to measure baby teeth, which the government stopped doing. The government had been begun to study baby teeth and bone in people until the early 70s, and then they stopped. And so we decided, uh, and I found a person by the name of Dr. Jay Gould, who was an economist and scientist who worried about the effect of chemicals on human health. And over the last many years now, we've been measuring and doing the baby teeth studies that were started by Dr. Barry Kamener at St. Louis University way back in the 1960s. And in fact, in the 50s, they got their first teeth. And it showed that the teeth, the radioactivity in the teeth from bomb testing rose and peaked in the neighborhood of 1965. And then when the bomb testing ended, just as infant mortality and low birth weight went down, everything kept going down. And it should have disappeared. By the late 70s, it should have gone to practically zero, as it did for many places in the world. But in the United States, it began to rise again. And there is no other reason for strontium-90 to exist than when it is produced by fission. And the only fission that was rising were the number of nuclear reactors that were operated in the United States. And as they were being driven to work harder and harder to put out more and more energy per year, the greater was the amount of strontium-90 that we found in the bone. And now, by the late 90s, we found that the radioactivity in some teeth of children were as high as during the time of nuclear bomb testing in the 50s. So we literally replaced the bomb fallout that Kennedy wanted to end with the releases that were so-called harmless releases from nuclear power plants all over, of which over 111 were built in this country, and 400 in the world, all around the world. And so we created 
an enormous hidden silent genocide when we continued to build bombs and to build reactors that were allowed to release as much as a bomb test released for the people in Utah and the downwinders who developed cancers and all kinds of terrible conditions. So our world has been completely transformed by the recognition that we cannot go on considering either using nuclear weapons ever and that we must convert our nuclear reactors to natural gas or oil or whatever is available because there's nothing more important than a newborn human life. And as a result, there have been enormous increases in the health care costs in the nation because when the children are born underweight or when they die, and when this is going on, then we find that the children are often saved by the modern techniques of medicine in our hospitals only to become autistic, to have developmental defects, to develop all kinds of diseases early in life, just like Dr. Alice Stewart had warned us about leukemia and cancer. And therefore we have no choice, because look at what happened, that when he investigated what happened to infant mortality when they were born especially when they were born at low weight, below five and a half pounds. In a place like New Hampshire, far away from the bomb testing, thousands of miles away. And this is what we found. And you can see that infant mortality was coming down beautifully the way it had since 1935. At 4% per year, and all of a sudden it stopped declining and every time there was a known bomb test in Nevada, there was a spike of infant mortality in New Hampshire. And not until the end of the bomb testing did it resume its decline. But then came underground tests, and one of them was called Bainberry, and it broke through 800 feet of rock and spewed radioactivity all over the workers and all over northern United States including almost every northern state in the United States and it caused another rise in the whole country and this also showed up in New Hampshire thousands of miles away from Nevada where the bomb exploded the Bainberry bomb that finally ended the effort to use bombs for peaceful purposes that was a brilliant idea of Dr. Edward Teller who wanted to keep on building and testing nuclear weapon and with the excuse that they could be used for useful things like building a new Panama Canal with nuclear weapons. And that madness was completely denied and it led to enormous suffering and this huge number of children in the United States dying prematurely of all kinds of conditions including infectious diseases because the strontium-90 that we had measured and the government had measured went to the bone and irradiated the bone marrow and in the bone marrow that's where the white cells the policemen of the body were formed that normally kill cancer cells and kill bacteria and if they are defeated if they are weakened it's like a police force being weakened in a great city and you get a crime wave and that's exactly what was happening. We were creating cancers because the defenses of the body were weakened by the strontium-90. But that was only part of the story. The greater tragedy is even that it affected not just children but adults. In fact, one of the great tragedies that occurred is that during the 1900 and during the period of the 1950, 60, there was an amazing increase in lung cancer among women who never smoked. When the bomb testing took place, the rise in strontium-90 led to something else, even though smoking declined during that period. And this is in the government data published in Health United States uh, 2002 and 2003. We see that lung cancer was rising among women when smoking declined. There's no way that smoking could explain the rise of lung cancer among women. 
So what was going on? Well, the same strontium-90 that was producing infant mortality all over the world, and especially in our country like New Hampshire and all over the Northern Hemisphere, it turned out that strontium-90, when it gives off this powerful electron, becomes another element. It's transformed into yttrium-90, and yttrium-90 goes to the soft tissue in the lung and it goes to every soft tissue organ, the kidney, it goes to the bladder, it goes to the liver, and it causes lung cancer, among other things, and emphysema, and all kinds of lung conditions, as just as this huge rise, in fact, that it went up from 5 to 25, a five-fold increase in the number of women, okay? who died of lung cancer, not to speak the ones who were saved and who, you know, who did not die. But this increase in death rate is what we have to recognize, that this is not a weapon that we can ever use, and is not a way to generate electricity that we thought was too clean, wonderfully clean, and too cheap to meter. Which I believed when I was a young scientist at Westinghouse because we made a mistake of thinking x-rays are the same as the, you know, as, as the fallout from an exploding bomb that caused in, in, in Japan a 12-fold increase in pancreatic cancer. Why pancreatic cancer, which is very difficult to treat? We've always had trouble, even if it was detected early, to cure it in the hospital, to treat it uh, in time. The reason was discovered in Germany by Spody and his colleagues in the 1950s, 58, 59. They worked with rabbits and animals and they gave them strontium-90 to see what would happen because it had been found already in 1942 when the first nuclear reactor was started that when animals like dogs were fed strontium-90 they would not only have babies, newborn dogs, puppies that were underweight and that died early, but they also found that it would lead to bone fractures. And osteoporosis is a terrible condition that affects many people, many women later in life, and so they found that the same thing was happening to women, was happening to the dogs that were given the strontium-90, the first waste products produced by a nuclear reactor at the University of Chicago in 1942. And that was secret. It was kept secret until 1969 when I found out about it at a meeting. And then I learned that it was all known for, by the government that in fact strontium-90 was a deadly poison and that it turned into yttrium-90 which concentrated most in the pancreas as Dr. Spody in Germany had discovered. And that explained why of all cancers, pancreatic cancer rose the most. And pancreas, the pancreas is also the place where diabetes originates because diabetes is caused by two kinds of things. Number one, it can damage the pancreas to such a degree that it fails to produce the insulin, the insulin which is needed to properly handle sugar in the body. And people get excessive high levels of sugar in their blood when the pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin. That's the most prevalent type of diabetes called diabetes type 2. Diabetes type 1 is when it generally more or less mainly observed and children and young people, mainly in their teens by the time it develops fully. And when it develops, it turns out that the pancreas stopped producing insulin. And so they had to get insulin eject injections all their life. And nobody could understand that this was related to bomb testing. In fact, nobody wanted to hear about it, but since then we've learned that the Survivors of Hiroshima, the survivors of Nagasaki, had an epidemic not only of cancer, but among other diseases and many other diseases, 
they also suffered from a rise in diabetes. And the same thing was true for the people in Belarus, who also suffered from terrible increases, not only in cancer, not only in thyroid cancer, not only in leukemia, but especially in diabetes. And now we know what happened. It was totally unexpected that the strontium would turn into yttrium and that the strontium has a half-life that decays into half of its intensity in about 28 years. So it builds up in the body of a mother when she gets all the milk to drink that she can possibly have because she's encouraged to get calcium. And, 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 and unfortunately, the cows concentrate calcium together with strontium-90 that came down over the years from the fallout on the grass and got into the leaves and stayed there for many years, but especially long in the bone of a mother and adults. And so we got an epidemic of not only cancer, but an epidemic of childhood diseases, cancer, and now even diabetes. And so what we're doing is we are really, really killing our own. In Connecticut, they build a nuclear reactor, and in 1976-78, in the 70s, 76, I found that the milk was highest than Trojan 90 near within a few miles of the Millstone nuclear reactor in Connecticut, dropping away in every direction. And as a result, we see a similar pattern of cancer, mainly in the area where the reactor is located, decreasing with distance away to the states, the neighboring states, as far away as Massachusetts increased, whereas the most distant state of Maine actually declined in cancer rate between 1970 and 75. There's no question that this could be due to anything else. And so we now know that unless we stop, we see this kind of epidemic we saw in Connecticut. Here is a plot of uh, thyroid, this is the cancer rate of thyroid cancer. And that rises across a whole, a whole state of Connecticut. We saw it now across a whole nation. And all along, it's directly related in recent years to the re energy generated per nuclear reactor in the United States. And therefore, there is no alternative and for us to end this, because here we find that diabetes had the same effect. As the energy per reactor was rising, so was the rate of diabetes. And I just gave a paper about this um, last year at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. There is no hope for mankind unless we learn the lesson. And that is hopefully not too late. Fortunately, when a reactor is turned off, infant mortality drops quickly. and all the deaths of early cancer in children decline, as we have proven and shown in over 21 papers that we have published in the scientific literature. But our government doesn't want to admit it, and even the National Academy, under pressure from our government, did a new study called BS7 in 1950. And they reviewed, they said, all the evidence of low-level radiation effects, and they did not cite one of all the 21 papers and five books that we've written on the subject. That is the future for which we're heading. If we continue the silence about the most deadly diseases that are plaguing us, and especially our newborn, then this nation is sealing its own doom.